I don't get ready for these meetings. Um, sometimes I get ready really early. I know what I'm going to say and I just work on it. And I don't usually get ready for these meetings until a couple days before them. Well, I spent Wednesday and Thursday getting ready for Saturday. And then I spent Friday and Saturday either driving or whatever. So I didn't have this when I woke up this morning saying, I know some ideas, but um, I, I really want to give a word that is relevant to not just the room, but the people. So I really just felt the release in my spirit of the Lord to talk about something that's really heavy on my heart now because of this week. And, and sometimes the best word you can give is that kind of word, the word that is really fresh and relevant to you. It's not just a word you go study out, but it's a word that you're living out. And so for part of that, I, I just, I want to say that I got to see a, a, a microcosm this week of what I had, you know, this friend and this life that I had lived and led in Missouri and pastored and got to see all of these people I knew my whole life and then be confronted on the way home this weekend with the life that you have, you know, it's what you had and what you have and, and then what you hope for because we're a hopeful people. Believers are supposed to be hopeful, like, like tomorrow is hopefully better than today. And, and I had just stood at a graveside and talked about that blessed hope that we, we live again and we see the people we've lost. And, and so I started thinking about community, and I don't have a big community here. And I watched hundreds of people there that I had known and had been a part of that community. So I'm driving home and I'm praying about that. As I say, I don't feel any sense of loss in that way, like... Like yesterday was better, but really I felt more optimistic. And that, that was encouraging to me, optimistic that I was coming home to be with a little community. And I, I, I think that we need to take that more serious in our walk with God. It's not about building a church. It's not about a big crowd. It's about a community, even if it's this size of people that you love and that love you and that you trust and that trust you. And you can't buy that and you can't market that. I don't think you can. You can market and get a big group, but you can't market community because we're sort of a narcissistic society. I mean, none of us really argue with that. Most of everything we, I mean, most of our focus in some one way or the other is about us ourselves, but I feel like in some ways we've let that narcissism drift over into, into our walk with God to where it's in some ways about me and not as much about my community. And some of that was a backlash because we come into grace and we had been in communities that just worked us to death. And, and oh, got another service Monday night. Oh, Tuesday evening, you know, potluck, Wednesday afternoon, visitation, Thursday morning prayer meeting. And you, went, you looked at your calendar and went, when am I supposed to sleep? You know, like, do we get to do anything with our lives? So, of course, we needed to backlash against that because we were exhausted and we're, ser we're slaves and, and we're not happy. And life's not about being happy, but it's at least about finding some satisfaction. We weren't finding that either. And so I think grace caused a lot of backlash and people just went, well, I don't, I don't need community at all. And I don't want any of that junk because I don't want to get obligated. I heard that forever when people come into grace. I don't want to be obligated. And in some ways, I now I look at it and go, well, too late. I mean, you you accepted Christ, you are obligated to go do something with that in the world. It's, it's bigger than you. you. I mean, if you just wanted something tiny, you shouldn't have accepted, you know, the creator of the universe. So there's a part of me that's like, hey, yes, we've got to put ourselves out there. And there's another part that, that, that says, yeah, I understand the, the, the pullback from that. The reason I brought up us being sort of narcissistic is I was thinking this week about that's, this is sometimes the weirdest stuff crosses your mind from Scripture. I was thinking about that moment where David dances before the Lord. Remember this Old Testament passage? I haven't preached that or taught that in years. And it was always one of those things that you use to show people how they shouldn't be ashamed to dance, you know, or to express themselves in worship. It's like, hey, why would you be embarrassed? David danced before the Lord. Why would you be embarrassed? And okay, you know. That doesn't help. That just makes me feel bad now about not wanting to dance because, well, I'm once, ag you know, like once again, I'm not as good as David. So, you know, thanks for pointing that out. I also can't use a slingshot. So, um, 
I don't think that was their intent, but it's kind of how I ended up with it. Um, but I got to thinking about the David dance before the Lord and, and, and then thinking about the, the rhythm and the give and take of dance. How when David danced before the Lord, I always saw it this way in Sunday school. David out there just going crazy in the street. You know, Michelle, his wife, gets embarrassed. I look at him out there making a fool of himself. And I always had him sort of just solo dancing around, you know, Michael Jackson style out on the street. But I don't think that's it because there was, there's been very few moments really in the history of art and dance and culture where dance was a solo act until now. That's what dance now is all about what you can do on the dance floor. Whereas even just a generation ago, it was how well you responded to your partner. Like now you don't ever need to think about who leads because you're both doing your own thing. You're putting on a show. But dance at its heart was who leads. You lead this time. I'll lead this time. And it was give and take. And that's the Bible's, that's why the Bible tells you to dance before the Lord. It's not show out in front of God because he's watching you do the robot. <laughs> dance is mutual. So to dance before the Lord is to to allow God to take the lead in that worship and allow God to take the lead in your life. And it's that give and take. So my brain's rolling and I start to think about what's that look like in community? Well, it looks like nothing without community. You know, I mean, there is no dance between two people without some sort of community. And so I'm thankful for that partner and I'm thankful for the community and I'm thankful for the fact that we get that as believers and that it's, it's one of the gifts of being a believer is that not only do we have him as a dance partner, but literally, I, I think literally, we have one another. That we're really going through this together if we'll let other people in on it. If you don't let anyone else in on it, then you're going through it all by yourself. And you, and you don't have anybody to lean on and you don't have anybody to listen to. And you don't have anybody to listen to you. And that sounds really, really good at first when you've been swamped with works. And then it sounds really, really lonely after a while when you've been set free to dance on your own. And you realize that the music's a whole lot better if you have somebody else. And I mean, we ought to be leaning on each other and leaning not away from community, but leaning into community because it's a special thing. Um, so that for me was, I, you know, I was dealing with the, uh, you get a little bit more sentimental, I think, when you start dealing with loss and you start thinking about what you've lost and then what you have. And you don't want to lose what you have because you know what it's like to lose what you just lost and, and it's not coming back. And so we all get confronted with all kinds of emotions. And one of the things that really hit me this week and, and that I thought if I was going to talk topical tonight, this is what I wanted to talk on was the fact that when you deal with loss, I think you you open yourself up to the idea of that could have been me. Okay, that's how I am. You, you look at this guy, this guy's got a kid my kid's age and they're very similar and we were good friends. You go, well, why wasn't it me? It could have been me, it's not me, it's this guy. And you can't say, well, this guy didn't know who he is in Christ or what I know, because this guy did. It's like had, had identity and, and freedom and relationship and, and um, and a surrounding supporting cast of community. So what comes in on the heels of it could have been me is to me is the spirit of fear and the idea of, well, what, what if something goes wrong in my life? What if something breaks down in my body? What if something's going through my bloodstream right now? What if, what if my brain doesn't function properly? What if my heart is in trouble? And that's what causes a nation of hypochondriacs and running off to the doctor every time we sneeze or cough because well, what if I've got some tumor or some cancer or, you know, what if, and we all get that way because we've heard of someone dropping dead. Well, he was perfectly healthy and, and he's just walking through the supermarket. And, and what happens in you is that little spirit of fear, that little voice inside that goes, well, you don't know. And, and, and we, we, we lean into it too much. I, I, I have. We lean into that voice that says, what if? And I don't think these are just emotions. I think there's something behind that. And I think it's an attack of the enemy. And I think it's the voice of the enemy who is intent on using these things as powerful motivators. I want to start with some of these thoughts as I talk about no fear. Fear 
is a powerful motivator. I want to give you a couple of spots from the New Testament. Remember John 20 when the disciples gather on Sunday night, resurrection night, and the Bible says in John 20 that they gathered behind closed doors. They gathered behind the door locked for fear of the Jews. And so the very first meeting post-resurrection of what will be the most powerful thing to ever touch the world, the church of Jesus Christ. Its very first meeting doesn't come, come together because they have faith in a risen Savior. Their very first meeting comes together because they're motivated by fear. They think that if they get caught in the street, someone's going to kill them. Um, so fear was their motivator. We get to Acts 5. That's not even that. Acts 5 is not that much farther along the timeline than John 20. It looks like it in the text, but it's not. It's just weeks maybe. I mean, it's, not, it's right after Pentecost. Look at Acts 5 when you get home and watch how scared the church is after the death of Ananias and Sapphira. They are petrified. They, they should abandon the semi-socialist economic activities they have going in Acts 4. Everybody, hey, everybody put all your stuff in one pile and everybody get what you need. And that's not going to work very well. The church abandons, its, abandons that idea rather quickly after Ananias and Sapphira died. But fear was a big motivator in how they begin to govern themselves. And then I, I think politics and pulpits, use it now. I mean, politics, for Pete's sake, every time you turn around, someone wants you to be scared of the other side. The left wants you scared of the right. The right wants you scared of the left. Both sides want you to be scared to stay in the middle. That's a terrible thing. I mean, you gotta, you know, you got to figure out which side you belong on. Um, and the middle's scared of both sides, and everybody's scared of everyone else. And the media runs with this because they put the word out there of what you ought to be worried about today. I've watched, you watch newscasts. You don't have to do anything special. Just turn it on, and this will happen eventually if you leave it on long enough. First of all, the worst is going to lead. We don't lead with the best stuff. We lead with the worst stuff because that's the stuff that causes people to come back after the commercial break. But also, have you noticed this tagline that happens a lot on your way to commercial? Such and so is when a test has been done. What you need to know, why this might be in your house and could be deadly to your kids coming up in 30 seconds. I mean, it's not so deadly you can't wait 30 seconds to hear about it. <laughs> but deadly enough that you better come back in 30 seconds because 60 seconds would be too long. Uh, they, it's peddling fear. Well, the pulpit does the same thing. And I think we all know it, whether we admit it or talk about it or not, but the pulpit does love to peddle fear, the fear of hell, the fear of death, even the fear of God. You know, I mean, the fear of hell is an easy one. If you haven't done this and if you've done this, well, you're probably going to burn in hell. And people go, well, that, I, that doesn't sound like a good ending, so let's do something about that. Uh, the fear of God is a biggie because the fear of God sounds, the fear of God, by the way, that one's, that one's peddled and amen People hear it, then they amen it. Because the fear of God is something like, if you don't do this for God, here's what the Bible says God's going to do to you. It's never what God's going to do for you. It's what God's going to do to you. And that ought to scare you. So if you're not giving X amount of money, then God's going to, what's he going to do to you? He's going to curse you. He's going to get your attention. How's he going to do that? I don't know, but he'll do it one way or the other. Don't be surprised if you lose your job. Don't be surprised if you can't pay your bills. Don't be... And what is that meant to do? Well, it's meant to get you to give, ultimately. But there's a tactic behind it, and the tactic is fear. So you're motivated now by ticking God off, ticking the devil off, going to hell, you know, getting yourself into physical trouble. I mean, maybe that sickness is God trying to teach you something. Maybe that problem you're going through is the Lord's way of getting your attention. I've heard, we've all heard that stuff. Um, I don't even know sometimes that we know how bad we're making God look. And I don't know why we keep serving that God. I mean, if you're sitting in that church and that's what you hear, why would you serve that God? He's not your friend. He's your enemy. He doesn't like you to be happy. He wants you to have no success. And he doesn't want you to learn anything without almost dying to get it. He's a worse parent than you are. And, and I, I, this one didn't happen this week, thank God, because you know, I got to do the funeral, but I've, I've, <laughs> sat through, I've sat through funerals of people and literally heard the minister say, hey, I know we don't know why God, why this so-and-so died, but I can tell you this, brother so-and-so was really good at X, Y, Z, and I've got to think that in heaven, God needed somebody to do X, Y, Z. 
There was a new angel singing in the choir. Boy, she had such a good voice, but can you imagine what the choir sounds like right now in heaven? And everybody nods and cries. and It's trying to give peace in people's hearts. But if you set back from the outside and go, why would you serve a God? He could have had anybody. You only get one. He gets all of them. And then he takes the one you have because he needs it. It's, I know we're trying to console people there. But at the root of that is fear. And the root of that is fear that you don't know what's coming tomorrow. So you better straighten up and fly right because God might take you or yours next. And you go, gosh, what, what, what am I going to do if that's the God that I serve? So I think the peddling of fear as an emotion, to me it's satanic because it's the exact same thing the devil sounds like when he comes to people in a word. He's always trying to scare people. And he's always trying to convince them that they're wrong and that they're going to die. And, and he's always trying to teach them bad things about God. So fear is the motivator. And where fear is the motivator, promise you you're not hearing from the Father. But fear is something else. Fear is weakness. Now, stay with me on this one because weakness is a condition. Weakness is not a definition. And I ask you a question before I give you any scripture. And the question is, is the Apostle Paul weak? Well, if I were to ask you that question, you didn't know the context. You didn't know we were talking about fear. If I said, is the Apostle Paul weak? Almost every Christian would go, no, Apostle Paul's not weak. He's the boldest, the best, the brightest. I mean, he has his revelation on the road to Damascus. He rebukes Peter to his face. You can't be weak and do what Paul does. I mean, he, he puts up with a lot of stuff, shipwrecked and stoned and nearly starved to death and imprisoned and ultimately lays his head on a chopping block, loses his life. How can you call him weak? But I want you to remember that weak, weakness is not a definition of who you are. It's not a definition of your character. Weakness is, is just a condition that you go through. It's a condition that you have. It doesn't define you. And we all go through moments of weakness. I, I don't think we're honest enough with ourselves in how many of us go through moments of weakness in our faith where our faith's just not as good. Now, if you come up in a Pentecostal culture like I did, you never admitted that your faith was bad because if your faith was bad, you might not even be saved. I mean, I mean that right? Now, I don't know if you came up in a similar culture, but you would have never said, well, I don't know if I believe that because people would have just looked at you. In fact, when I was younger, if you asked questions about the Bible, it was highly likely. It wasn't a 50-50 odds. It was like 90-10 odds that the answer you got from leadership was going to be, was not an answer, but rather a question back to you. What's wrong? Don't you believe it? You go, ooh, okay, maybe I shouldn't have asked. No, you shouldn't have asked because asking means you don't believe it. And doubt doesn't fly with God. And then you start quoting scriptures out of context. Whatever's not of faith is sin. So if you're approaching this issue, but you don't believe it, that's a sin within itself. Well, now, ready-made, ready-made invitation. Just start the music because I'm running to the altar and I'm going to ask God to forgive me for not believing and help me to believe. I don't need to understand it. Just help me believe it. So you end up believing a bunch of stuff you don't understand. Anyone? No. <laughs> I did. That's what the deconstruction was in me and grace. That's why you got to go. I had to comb through the Bible again and go, wait, what about this? I don't know. Do you believe it? I don't know anymore if I believe it or not. Now I'm okay with saying I don't know. Before I was able to say I don't know, then I just kind of moved past it, you know, to the next passage. Because, I, well, yeah, I believe it. What is it? I don't know what it is, but I believe it. And <laughs> what good's that do anybody? I don't know what it is, but I believe it. Why? Because it's written. <laughs> and so... We can be, some of us are weak about our faith, but there's weakness about other things. We'll get into some of those as we go. But I, I don't want you to think of weakness as a condition. I want you to think of it as a definition. Here's why. Look at our first text today. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The reason I asked you, is the Apostle Paul weak, is because you know he wrote stuff like Corinthians. So this is Paul talking. I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul wants to be the calling card, sort of the hallmark of his ministry. There's a lot of stuff I can talk about, and of course he can. Saul knows a bunch of stuff about Judaism. He doesn't lose all that because he becomes Paul. So he has all this knowledge, but he says, I don't, I don't talk about any of that stuff. But really, all I talk about is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Three, I was with you in weakness, in fear, 
and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. You could read that and think Paul means they were weak and they were trembling. But if you read that context, Paul, Paul's not talking about I was with you in your weakness and in your fear and in your trembling. No, I was with you in weakness, fear, and trembling, and my speech and my preaching did, had no persuasive words of human wisdom. What did I have to lean on? Demonstration of the Holy Spirit and the power so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How would your faith be in the wisdom of men? It can't be. I didn't share any wisdom and I was weak and I was trembling and I knew that the only way to convince you of reality was not to talk you into it because what could I say? The only way to convince you of reality was to show you the demonstration. Now, just in case you're not sure about my interpretation, well, maybe he really doesn't mean himself. Maybe he's not weak. Maybe they're weak. That's possible. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Same writer, same audience, different book. Therefore, having these promises, verses 1 through 7. Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Open your hearts to us. We haven't wronged anyone. We've corrupted no one. We've cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn, because I've said before that you're in our hearts, to die together, and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all of our tribulation. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Did you catch that? This is Paul. So when I got here, everything, all hell had broken loose outside, outside of who we are, outside of who I am. There was nothing but chaos. Inside, fear. Now that's a biggie to admit that what's going on inside is fear because most of us wouldn't admit that. You say, how you doing? No one that you ever says, how are you doing to says to you, I'm afraid. Very few. And to do that, you got to be super intimate with somebody to say, I'm, well, and, and no, we, we don't want them to anyway. I mean, you don't say to the cashier at Publix, hey, how you doing? You don't expect her to go, well, I'm pretty much scared to death. You go, you go whoa, just, just keep the items. We went somewhere this week for lunch and the servers, the, it wasn't even our waiter, it was the server, the guy, or not the server, but the, the guy that just walks you to your table the guy walks us to our table and he's putting the menus down and he goes, how are you guys today? And we do the normal, well, we're, we're good, we're good. And I, and I said, how are you? And he goes, well, I got a lot of issues in my personal life, but it's going to be okay. You guys have a good meal. Your waitress will be here in a minute. <laughs> That's literally what happened. And I looked across the table at the girls. And I said, what, what were we supposed to say to that? I mean, it's so rare for someone to open up like that. And he didn't want help. He just wanted someone to know. I mean, he literally said half of it walking away. I got a lot of things going on in my personal life. I'm having a lot of trouble today, but it's going to be all right. You guys have a good meal. I mean, just literally, so it's backing off. It was, the, it, was the, it was the negative clothes, you know? Like, so you guys don't want to buy this car today? Okay, we'll just pass on it, that kind of thing. The guy that sells no vehicles. Uh, but it's rare. It's really rare for that to happen. It's, it's rarer still for you to say, how are you doing? And someone goes, well, I'm scared. And if someone actually did say that to you in your life, you probably would really perk up like, what are you scared of? I mean, could I, is there any way I could help you? What, what could I do? There's a concern when we see people deal with fear, but we don't do that probably because we don't want to pull people into that circle, but we also don't want to appear to be weak because that seems to be like the biggest no-no in the world is to appear to be weak especially to people that don't know you. You know, appear to be weak to the people that love you, that's one thing, because they can help you, but don't appear to be weak to the people that know you or that don't know you. Um, Paul's, Paul's on intimate terms with Corinth, but there's gonna be a lot of people that hear this letter that don't know him, and, and I don't know how many of us he thought would read this, but maybe would he have changed his tune if he knew you were gonna read this 2,000 years later? I don't know. I mean, I would probably second guess myself if I thought in 2,000 years they're gonna be reading this stuff I wrote down and, and one of the things is going to be that, hey, I'm outside stuff's 
terror, you know. I mean, look at that. Outside's conflict, inside fear. I'm scared. Why am I scared? Because there's conflict outside. And I'm weak. And this fear has hit me. Let's finish the passage. Nevertheless, God. Nevertheless, God is always a good place to start when you have fear inside. So nevertheless, God is a great turning point who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And that sentence to me proves that Paul's not talking about their fear. He's talking about his fear. And if he's talking about his fear in 2 Corinthians, I think he was talking about his fear in 1 Corinthians. So here's Paul admitting uh, that he, had, he has a problem. Comfort us by the coming of Titus, not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Paul admits his fear, but did you see how Paul says his fear meets its antidote? Because it's right there. Conflict outside, fear on the inside. And then I heard about my buddy Titus. And not only did I hear about Titus, Titus is coming. Not only did I hear Titus is coming, Paul goes farther. I love this little moment, verse 7. I also heard the consolation that he was given by you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me. I rejoiced even more. In other words, to me, this is what 6 and 7 say. I had conflict outside. I have fear on the inside. But my fears were assuaged when I heard good news. And the good news was my good buddy Titus was coming. It was kind of, it's kind of like you hearing news that someone you love is going to show up and see you. And the minute you go, oh, someone that I love is going to show up and see me. Oh, that's good news. What happened to your fear? Well, it's not as bad anymore. Why? Because someone that loves me is going to be there. And someone that cares for me is going to be there. And someone that has my ear is, and my heart is going to be there. Someone that will listen to me and that will let me listen to them and will help me and let me help them in return. All of these are good news. To me, this is a little bit of community. This is why community is such a beautiful thing because you get to go in with your fear. And the reason why... Church isn't working for some of us with community is because we're not allowed to come in as we are. We're not allowed to bring our real self in. we got to bring this fake persona in so that everybody thinks we're up Superman Christian. And we're not allowed to come in broken. And we're not allowed to come in weak. And we're certainly not allowed to come in sinning and, and admit it. You know, here's what's going on. And without some massive public transformation ceremony... And the reality is, is we'd rather just hide in a hole somewhere and not deal with it and see if it goes away on its own. And Paul knew that doesn't work because fear needs good news. Let me show you a couple things about fear. One thing that is, it does and one thing that it doesn't. Start in the negative. Fear does not respond to good advice. In fact, fear grows with good advice. Now, I'll say fear responds to good news in a moment. Let's deal with good advice. I, I think there's a difference. I think that the Old Testament is full of good advice. Example, don't kill. <laughs> now, I'm using an extreme piece of advice. But if I could offer you some advice, it's this. When you get in a conflict with someone, when you're in a disagreement with someone, when you don't like someone, here's some good advice. Don't kill them. Because if you kill them, they're gone, and they're never coming back. And that's the best possible outcome. And then there's a bunch of bad stuff that's going to happen to you and to your family and to your future and ultimately maybe to your own life. Okay, nobody needed that advice. Most of us would have, we don't go straight to kill. But that's good advice, don't kill. Fear does not is not assuaged with good advice. That's Old Testament advice. Good news is New Testament. Jesus come to do something for you, okay? And I used an extreme example. Let's use a more practical one. How is fear fed by good advice? Well, when somebody gives you advice about your life and it's something that you're not doing or it's something you have been doing that you probably ought to stop doing, fear is almost fed instantaneously. Like it's probably really good advice if you would stop eating that. And you start to realize that all of the symptoms that, that that article lists are exactly what's going on in you. And so even though you were given good advice, it didn't set you free from fear. It actually made you fear worse. 
So things get worse the more that you start to heed or look at the advice. Now we could say, well, it's getting worse because you're not heeding the advice. But the reality is, is there's no New Testament moment in which good advice assuages fear. But there's a lot of New Testament where good news assuages fear. Jesus is determined to continue to put good news into his disciples post-resurrection. Every time he's gone, they're scared to death. But every time he shows up, something happens because good news, he's arrived. And I think for Paul, what he saw was that fear responds to good news. As the good news becomes a part of your reality and a part of what you understand, fear begins to respond to that. It has to. Let me show you an example of, of Paul's usage of something along these lines in Romans 8.15. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. To me, that's the best news the New Testament has because there's two things happening in this verse. There's the old bondage way of living and there's the new daddy way of living. And that, I'm simplifying it, but that's the basic of it. The basics are this. You, you used to have it. That's why you get again. See that word again? You didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear which is where you've got to do this or God will do this. You've got to do this or God will do this. And that sounds like Sunday morning, go to meeting. You got to do this or God will do this. But that's actually the spirit of bondage again to fear. What you have received, one you didn't get, the other one you get. So why the first one always grates you the wrong way? Because it's not in tune with your spirit, the spirit that, you, that who saved you. So there's always something wrong with it. And we'll even, I don't know how long I'll stay on that, but. We'll even fight against that feeling and go, you know, that feeling is you rebelling against the Holy Spirit. That's not me rebelling against the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit rebelling against you. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit going, stop pulling this garbage. What are you doing? Your father's not against you. You're not in bondage. What are you scared of? Don't be scared of the father. Don't be scared of his son. Don't be scared of the Holy Spirit. And yet most of us spend too much of our Christian experience, if we're honest, in, in some form of bondage or the other in regards to that. The flip side of that coin is that you have received. So you can look at what you haven't received, bondage again to fear. What have you received? Well, you've received the spirit of adoption. And in that spirit of adoption, you get to call God your father. You get to say, hey, he's my dad. And I didn't do anything for that because I didn't do anything to be the son of Rick and Levita White. I just am. Okay? And so you look at your own life that way in Christ all you've done is believe on him, and he did everything. You didn't do to get it. You just believed that it was yours. And then you receive it, or you don't receive it. And a lot of believers don't walk into half of their inheritance because they don't believe that it's theirs. They don't receive it. And so one of the things I want you to focus on is not just what you didn't receive and what you did receive, but one of the things I want you to focus on is that Paul felt all of this was in the realm of the Spirit. And so for Paul, if he says, I'm, there's a fear in me, for Paul, that was something very influenced in the unseen. And so I think what we're dealing with a lot of times are the voices of the enemy trying to cause us to doubt our what we have really received. Because what you haven't received is the spirit of bondage again to fear. So when there's fear involved, there's a spirit behind it. What you have received is the Holy Spirit who knows you're one of the Father's children and wants you to know it. And if you give in to the spirit of fear, you start to run off into the area of dread. In fact, look at the definition. Fear as we've used it, every passage we've used it so far, the Greek definition, the Greek word is phobos, fear, dread, terror. Phobos, by the way, is where we get, we derive from the Greek word for phobia. So if you have a phobia, what is that? That's a fear of. And then we put a word in front of phobia to define the kind of fear you have. We have whole books on this in our culture. What's your, what's your phobias? We even talk about it. Like it's normal, like, like it's just an acceptable part of our existence when I think there's a real spirit behind anything that causes you fear, dread, and terror. And you shouldn't lean into fear. You should give, put good news into your life. What's the good news? You've received the spirit of adoption whereby you ought to be calling him daddy, father. If you could just rest in that, fear has to respond to good news. It's the only thing fear responds to. 
And it won't respond to just you trying harder or you doing better, but it will respond to some sort of good news in your life. Let me give you a couple of those passages, okay? And then we're going to shift gears to a different Greek word. But here's a couple of those kinds of, though, that, that kind of phrase that uses phobos, phobia, okay? Hebrews 2, 14, 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That's Jesus partaking of flesh and blood. That's not eating. That's sharing by experience. So that through death he, he, he could destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. 15, watch this. Release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So there's a bondage, there's a fear, and it's not yours. Why? Because Jesus has been you and died in your place. So why are you scared of dying? Well, we're not really scared of dying because we know where we're going. And why is it that, we're, why is it that we know where we're going? Is it because you've got 15 verses you could share with me on heaven? The answer to that question is no, you don't, because there's not that many. But the reason that we're not scared of dying is because Jesus came out of the tomb and walked up to his disciples and said, See, death isn't the end. So you die, but you're not finished. I'm here and I promise you that I'm real. He goes, reach out and touch me. He says, Spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. He goes, if I'm real and you're in me and I'm in you, then your life will be real and there's nothing left for you to fear. And honestly, most everything we fear in this world is because we're afraid to die. Why won't you go skydiving? Is it because you don't like thrills or you don't like adrenaline? No, it's because you are afraid you're going to die. That's, that's it, simply. Even if you're not really afraid that the parachute won't open, you're afraid that you'll have a heart attack on the way down because you're so scared that you're going to die. Almost all of our fears are rooted in this fear that we're going to die, and yet one of the underpinning messages of Hebrews is, he does this early in the book. It's, it's Hebrews 2 because he's saying, Jesus is better than all your stuff. He's better than your Moses. He's better than your Israel. And he's better than your temple. You know what? The reason why you ought to honor him is because he set you free from being scared of stuff. You don't have to be afraid of dying anymore because what's there to be afraid of? He showed you that you get to live on the other side of it. You get to have the life that he has. By the way, that fear, Phobos, it's terror and dread because we've been terrified to die. Here's another one, 1 John chapter 4. Most of us know this one, verse 18, there's no fear in love, perfect love casts out fear. By the way, fear, phobos, perfect love casts out phobos, phobia, because phobos, phobia, involves torment. Torment's a bad, it's a bad translation. Torment, better translation out of the Greek is punishment. And I think that really makes this verse pop to me. Because if you read it that way, then it's this. There's no, there's no, I'll read the, we'll read the Greek definition into fear, okay? There's no dread or torment in love. Perfect love casts out dread and torment because fear or dread and torment involves torment makes no sense right that's why i don't like the word torment it's wrong it's not the right greek word uh, again let me slow down fear is phob phobos dread torment there's no fear there's no dread and torment in love but perfect love casts out dread and torment because dread and torment involves torment that does that's stupid that's redundant <laughs> Okay, let's do it right. There's no, there's no dread and torment in love. Perfect love casts out dread and torment because dread and torment involves getting punished. That's the reason you dread and torment. It's because you think somebody's about to smack you and that somebody has the power to kill you. At least that's how we view God. And so what are we dreading and, tor uh, dreading and fearing? We're dreading and fearing that we're going to be punished. If you can release people from the fear of punishment, that God is not against you, he's for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? So if God is for me, and he's not out to smack me, and he's not out to put me in bondage, then what am I so scared of? What am I so afraid of? Well, the answer is you probably shouldn't be afraid of anything. You still are. We are from time to time. But again, it's not because that's who we are, because... Fear is not our definition. Weakness is not our definition. It's just a current condition. It doesn't mean that I am weak or I am fearful. It means I have some fear. What can I do with my fear? I can start to hear good news. Good news. 
You're not going to be smacked down because you failed. Good news. God became you. <laughs> That's the best news. God became you to show you you can't do it. I can do it. Let me live and you will do it together. It's good news. That's not good advice. It's good news. And you receive that good news and you walk into freedom. But there's another one. Fear. Here's the other definition. Fear also in the New Testament is the Greek word dalia. And this dalia means timidity or cowardice. Now, the interesting thing about dalia is how little it appears in the New Testament. In fact, one time. Now, I am a sucker for token appearances in the Bible. Always have been. If you show me a Greek word that never shows up again, I get super curious as to why you would use that word one time, you wouldn't use that word two times. I get super curious when that word also has other usages, but you choose to never use that one. Okay, for instance, phobos, fear, that's all over the place in the New Testament. That's in every writer. Everybody talks about fear. But this one, Dalia, one time. And you could have used Phobos. Could have just said terror or dread, but you talk about cowardice, which is a whole different kind of fear. And here it is. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of Dalia, a spirit of timidity or cowardice, but a power and of love and a sound mind. Now, most of us have never really thought about the fact that that word is not the same word that is everywhere else. This is an entirely different spirit that we get confronted with every day that has nothing to do with the spirit of shaking and dread and terror. This is, God did not make you a coward. God did not make you to be run over. God did not make you timid. He did not give you fear in not the dread terror way, but he didn't give you the kind of fear that causes you to shake like a reed in the wind and not speak up for who you are, and not take a stand for your position, and not assert your identity, and not take authority over the enemy. And if you aren't doing those things, maybe it's because you've allowed yourself to, be, to feel a coward or timid in the presence of who you really are. Now, I think we need the context. So I want to close with this verse and everything that surrounds it, okay? Not the whole book, but starting in verse 3. <laughs> Okay, here's verse 3 through 12. Our verse is in here. It's not on this. It's at the very bottom, right? We're going to get to it, and then we're going to go past it. We're going to watch this little sandwich we build. The meat is our text, that dalia, that spirit of cowardice. Paul talking to Timothy, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. I greatly desire to see you, being mindful of your tears. He, you, is Timothy. I want to see you, Timothy. I'm mindful of your tears. So that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that's in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, because God didn't give you the spirit of fear. Now, don't, don't go to the next screen. Just watch this. Because God didn't give you the spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a sound mind. Advice from an old man to a young man. You're crying. You're sad. But you're better than that. Because I know your grandma, and I know your mom. And they both are believers. And they have deep faith. They're a lot like me. That's what he says. I serve with, as my forefathers did. There's the setup. He goes, I've been in this a long time. I got deep roots. You know what? You've been in this a long time because you've got deep roots. Your mama and your grandma taught you better than this. And you're, you're, you're crying, middle of being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. That's weird. I'm mindful that you're crying. It fills me with joy if I could take care of that. How am I going to take care of that in you? I'm persuaded, and I want to remind you to stir up the gift of God that's in you through the laying on of my hands. You need to stir it up and stop ignoring it because God didn't give you this spirit of cowardice and timidity. He gave you power and love and a sound mind. And so most every time in your life, what you need is already inside of you. When Judas Iscariot dies... And the text says his, he, he, he hangs himself and his bowels gush out. One of those moments in the scriptures you go, why did they tell us that? That's gross. The Gospels leave that out, but Acts tells you. His bowels gushed out. And I think it's because the book of Acts wanted to remind you what was inside of his bowels. As gross as that sounds, the last thing he did before he walked out and killed himself is he reached across the table and he ate the communion bread and he drank the cup of a new covenant. 
and he drank, he put them both into his body and he got up and walked out and took 30 pieces of silver and went and kissed Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And he goes back into the temple and throws it on the floor and he puts a noose around his neck and he dies. And the answer he needed was inside of him the whole time. But he gave in to all those outside sounds. And Paul tells Timothy, stop it. <laughs> Dry your eyes. You're better than this. You got a mom and a grandma that raised you better. This is, to me, this is a bold enunciation of there's some things you need to get over, but it's not because I'm giving you good advice. It's because somebody put some good news inside of you. Now use it because you didn't get the spirit of being a coward. You have power and you have love and you have a sound mind. Eight. Therefore. See, therefore. I know what it's there for. Therefore. Since you know that, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner. Share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who saved us, who called us with a holy calling. He didn't do it because you and I were good. He did it because he has a purpose and grace that he gave to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But it's been revealed when Jesus appeared and he abolished death and he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I'll stop there. What a moment. Paul is saying to Timothy to say, look, you've got it inside of you. So stop crying and stop giving into a spirit of cowardice and stir up power and love and a sound mind. And don't you dare be ashamed of this thing because it's bigger than you and it's better than anything else out there. And if you'll stir it up, it's not you that did it. It's him that does it. And he abolished death and brought life and immortality so what and this is paul's final question i think is so what are you so scared of now if you read that from the apostle paul i think you'd buck up and go do something and you're like i think it's time to go get busy in the world i titled this lesson today no fear because i think it's the enemy of the believer you can sit around all day long try to figure out if there's a devil and what he looks like and how he gets in the whole time you're trying to figure everything out, you're giving in to fear and the spirit of fear and working over your fear. Receive good news. Find out everything the Bible has to say about you and your condition. It's important. Receive that good news. Let that be reality in your life. Let's pray. I want to pray over you these words, and I want to pray as a community, thanking God for that community. Father, I want to thank you for this. You had me as a mouthpiece this week to touch a lot of people's lives that were in a lot of pain and had faced a lot of fear and, and uh, in it, I'm learning some stuff because what good is it for us to go around if we're not going to learn? So you've taught me some things this week and just begun to speak some powerful and things into my life. And I pray that I have conveyed those in a way today that help your kids. There's going to be a lot of people who tune in to sermons like this because they're afraid and they want to figure out if they don't have to be. They're going to see a title like No Fear and, and be looking for something to get them over that hump. So, Father, I hope the words we've said will do that, but I know the power of the Holy Spirit will do it. So I pray the power of the Holy Spirit into their life and into these words. And for every person in this room, we've all given in to that fear more than once. It doesn't define us. It's just a temporary condition, but let's move past it and help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.